great. Over to you, Kai San. Thank you. Okay, I'll just share my share my Thank screen. You. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Um, there is still a this meeting is being recorded sign. I don't know if anybody else can see it in the middle of the slide. I can't, Claire. Can you press you have to press got it. Okay. Have you tried, have you tried pressing that? I've done, I just did it. I'm sorry. My mistake. Thank you. Um, so, so thank you. Um, thank you for introducing us and, um, and good afternoon. Really, uh, really good to, uh, to spend some time with you today. Um, just a few minutes, really, up to an hour, talking about gambling. Um, and essentially gambling harm. So um, we come from the Southwest area, um, introducing myself, my name is Claire, and I'm the training and engagement lead for the women's programme. Uh, my colleague, uh, Lindsay, educational training lead for the young people's programme. And between us, we're gonna be talking about women and uh, gambling affected harm and young people and gambling and uh, gaming and affected harm, um, both of which you may be familiar with. Um, certainly it's an epidemic currently that we're really concerned about um, as a nation. And uh, we come from an organization called GAMCARE. Uh, GAMCARE has been around for about 25 years, but probably best known for the National Gambling Helpline, which often people are aware of, and certainly from the Women's Programme, were funded by the National Gambling Commission. So what we'd like to do in the next few minutes really is to talk about the risks of problematic gambling, um, to signpost our services, which are all free, and to offer you ongoing some contact details should you need our help or our services or advice as we go forward. So uh, uh, thank you once again for your time. We'll hit the slides and we'll see where we go. So what we're gonna look at is how problematic gambling occurs and what it looks like. And the first thing I would say is that it's not often to spot problematic gambling. And the reason for that is it's a very silent addiction. It's particularly silent amongst women rather than men. And there's a few reasons for that that we'll talk about as we go through. But women often don't come forward and say that they feel at risk of gambling harm. We'll also look at the impacts of problematic gambling on not just the gambler, but affected others. Um, there are more affected others, so more people that are affected by somebody else's gambling. Um, and we'll be looking today at um, how you'll meet them and uh, the characteristics that they might display and the services that we can help them with. And then also what you can do to support people. Um, we don't expect uh, anyone outside of GAMCARE to necessarily be gambling experts. We just ask that you know that GAMCARE exists and that we have services available and you can signpost to us or through us um, and uh, you know that, that we're here and uh, are willing to help not just affected others, but also problematic gamblers as well. Um, and at this stage, I'd also like to introduce Gracia, my colleague from the Women's Programme, um, who you'll be meeting a bit further on. Uh, I'm the Southwest region of the Women's Programme and Gracia is the London and surrounding area. So she'll be joining us too today. Okay, next slide then, please. So how problematic gambling occurs and what it looks like. Um, it's very difficult to, to talk about what it looks like because it's a hidden addiction, as we've said. And it's particularly uh, so for women. Um, and we know that from talking to women with problematic gambling issues. Um, so what we will be doing today is uncovering really, if, if women don't talk about it, how can you as professionals spot it? How can you spot people who maybe are the subject of gambling abuse, um, maybe of debt abuse, people who are being um, 
pushed into to, to things that they don't want to do, maybe by a partner that's to do with gambling. So we'll come from that perspective as well today. Um, when we think about what it looks like, sounds like and feels like, what I would say is that certainly gambling is everywhere within our nation. And we're not here to say there's anything wrong with that. Probably about 94% of the nation um, have boundaries and guidelines. They gamble sensibly. Uh, they have limits, um, but certainly for those who where gambling is an addiction, it's a little more, a little more serious and a little more intense. So these are some definitions, which I'm sure you'd be familiar with. I'm sure we know what gambling is. Um, but one thing to point out there is that Gambling is not just about staking or risking money. It's also of something or anything that is of value. Um, and sometimes people will argue and say, well, actually, it's, you know, I, I gamble on the, my trainers or I gamble on food or I gamble on drugs. Or, you know, and that, that surely isn't gambling. But actually, it is when there is an outcome of something involving child. Problematic gambling is when it starts to become uh, a compromise, a disruption or a damage within a family, um, as it says there, within employment, personal or recreational pursuits. Um, evidence suggests that probably about 6% of the nation uh, currently have a moderate to a severe gambling addiction. That's the adult section of the UK. Uh, which probably doesn't sound like a lot, six and a hundred people, but uh, when you look at how many are affected by that, then the numbers certainly of harm increase dramatically. And gambling related harm, so again, the adverse impacts that we could all be part of. Um, you know, if we get our house burgled, if our children are peddled drugs outside of school, um, there are often in terms of crime, et cetera, there could well be gambling behind it, a gambling addiction that is, uh, is fueling some of the, the problems that we're facing in society and our community today. Thanks, Claire. I'll just talk through the continuum. Um, thank you everyone for being late. I had the wrong link, um, but like Claire said, my name's Gracie and I also work with Claire on the Women's Programme. I cover London in the South East and I'm really happy to be here today. So Claire touched on before um, the difference between gambling and in control gambling, which a lot of the country take part in. So if you do the lottery, if you do scratch cards, if you do um, en enter the adverts on TV, daytime TV, like I do, because I'm trying to win tax-free cash, then you do take part in gambling. But there is a difference between, like she talked about, between gambling and problematic gambling. And at GamCare, we focus on problematic gambling. And on this continuum, you will see you know, how people start off in control and can move down that continuum to problematic. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're intervening at the right time. We're spotting those signs and we're able to get people into treatment if they need that. So you can see on the in control side, you can see that it's occasional. It's fun. It's normally for entertainment purposes. So I might say to Claire, you know what, Claire, we work really hard on the women's program. Maybe at the end of the month, let's go to the casino and have a blowout. Our budget is 50 pounds. If we win money, fantastic. If not, I always enjoy Claire's company anyway. So it's a win-win for me. And you see people stick into spending limits and that would be in control gambling. When you start to go to the increased risk, you start to see people gambling more frequently. So now, even though I say to Claire, we go once a month, I might start, I might start going on my own, maybe two, three times a month instead of that once a month. And you also start to see people diversifying. So you won't just be seeing them gambling in the casino or doing football betting because that's what they know. They will start gambling on ice skating in Russia or they'll start gambling on who's going to win the next X Factor or they'll start gambling on a range of different things that they have no clue about but it's really just about participating and taking part in that game of gambling that is the 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 thrill and the enticement. And then you start to see people chasing losses. So for example me and Claire are in the casino now I've lost the 50 pounds and I'm like hold on a minute I actually need that money back. 
So I'm going to try and put in an extra 20 pounds to try and recoup that loss. And what happens is not only do I lose that extra 20 pounds, but I'm now starting to overspend. I'm going over my budget. I'm going over my limits. And that can lead to a real big slippery slope. You'll be surprised and shocked how many people find themselves chasing losses and end up in hundreds of pounds of debt because they were trying to chase that tenor that they lost. Um, you also see, see concealment. People start to lie about their gambling, not just about how much money they're spending on it, but also about how much time that they're spending on gambling. So you see that preoccupation, people finding difficult, difficulty to concentrate on other things. So even people at work will think about when's the next time I can gamble. People who are out with friends having a good time socially will think, hold on a minute, where, where can I go to gamble? Where can I spend some time alone so I can gamble? So you do see that and people becoming more isolated because they're trying to cover up their gambling. They may not be able to attend other functions because they don't have enough money because they're spending all their money on gambling as well. So those are some of the things you see in increased risk. When you get to the problematic stage, you start to see people borrowing money or even resorting to thought of a theft and fraud. So stealing money. We have loads of people who say, you know, I've stolen from family members, I've stolen from work to fund their gambling addiction. And it is really sad that we have a big gambling problem in prisons. And we have a criminal justice program as well that works in prisons with people who, um, are gambling in prison and have a problem with gambling in prison. And I want to take your mind back to the definition Claire gave us in the beginning when she said to stake money or anything of value on the outcome of something involving charts. And in prison, even though they might not have access to cash, they will gamble with different things. They will gamble with favors. They will gamble with food. They will gamble with different things. So there's a massive problem in prison with gambling. And the sad thing is if someone goes into prison with a gambling addiction and that's not dealt with, when they come out, unfortunately, they do often resort back to a life of crime to fund that addiction because it hasn't been resolved. So for us, it's really about getting into prisons and highlighting you know, the issue of gambling addiction so that can be dealt with. Constantly thinking about gambling, like we talked about that preoccupation, relationships at home and work starting to suffer. We see a massive link between domestic abuse and gambling and addiction and that's something we're working really hard on the women's program we're working with women's aid we're working with refuge and so many different organizations to really tackle that issue because we do see a link between the two and it's really about identifying it and taking it seriously and we also see suicidal thoughts um the house of laws they did a report last year and they attributed one completed suicide a day to gambling addiction which is higher than any other addiction so it is a really serious issue and with the lived experience that we do on the women's program, I think about 80% of our participants had talked about thinking about completed suicide. So it is a really big issue that we're, you know, we're not focusing on. And it's something that we do have to take seriously. And um, because it's so normalized in our community and because so many of us take part in it safely, it makes it even harder for those who find, you know, who have problems with it to come forward and really talk about their issues. And what we wanna do is normalize that conversation and make sure we raise awareness about it. So people feel more comfortable to disclose that they have an issue. So you can see at the bottom of the page, Jerry says brief advice and brief intervention. and structured treatment and that really is about we will and we will expand on that a little bit later on in the training but it really is about having that conversation with people and saying is your gambling affecting your life and if it is there is a place where you can get support and advice and help and that will look different for so many different people but it is really about providing that option and providing that safe place to have that conversation so that's what the continuum looks like and anyone who gambles in any shape or form will sit somewhere on that continuum it's really about identifying where you sit and making sure that you get the appropriate help and support that you need. Thank you, Lindsay. Can I do this one? Yes. Or we do it between us, Grace, we do it between us. <laughs> so I, I believe, um, I don't know if you'll agree with this, I believe that everybody's actually at risk of addiction, yes. uh, given the right time, day, situation, circumstance, life. Um, however, there are people who are potentially more at risk of developing a gambling addiction or addiction per se. And uh, these nine are listed below, they're not exhaustive. I'm sure you can think of more, but equally there may be people within uh, your, your client base, you know, people that you, you have as customers or clients or service users, you may well come under some of these brackets. And what we would say is if, you, um, if you're aware of these, then, then crucially gambling could be underneath that. There could be, there could be more to it. And it's worth investigating a little further. So talked about the fact already that women don't say that they have a gambling addiction or that they're concerned about gambling. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. 
and one of the reasons is that they're worried that they'll get in trouble with authorities. Um, maybe they'll get reported. Maybe that will mean that their children are being neglected in the eyes of the law or their social worker or their local you know, organization that they work with. Can they go cap in hand and ask for a food voucher at the local job center if they're gambling too much? You know, will this, will this limit them? And also the stigma, women don't like to be associated perhaps with the stereotype of the, um, of the gambling that we might imagine the woman that might go into the bookies or the woman that might go to a bingo hall because actually the way that women are really gambling pretty much at the moment is on their phones so they are downloading. Um, uh, there are many organisations, but the ones that spring to mind this morning are Gala Bingo, because I've seen it, and Foxy Bingo. So those sorts of sites, slot machine sites, poker sites, things like that. I think you probably never have to watch telly or never listen to the radio if you've never seen one, because they are everywhere and they sponsor TV programmes like Everdale, etc. So they get their way to, to, to put those adverts all the way through. Anyway, um, so those are some of the risk factors. I think some are probably quite... Um, self-explanatory in terms of uh, low self-esteem perhaps. Um, but just to, to talk about a couple of those, um, I'll, perhaps I'll take a couple and then Gracia could take a couple if that's all right, Gracia. Um, if I talk about an early big win, first of all, very often when we talk to uh, people with lived experience and we take those conversations and those, those meetings and peer groups very seriously, as Gracia said, people will often say to us, you know, the worst thing that could have happened to me was an early big win, because that is what hooked me. And very often with these gambling organisations, there is almost a setup that people do win early on. And people therefore think they're either beating the system or they think that um, they're lucky uh, or this is the way forward. And um, so be aware that early big wins or free payouts or free spins, you know, you put £10 down, we'll match it sort of ideology um, is often used to promote gambling and hook people in. And as we've talked about, about 6% of the nation could actually be under risk because of that. Um, contact with the criminal justice system, obviously we talked about that already. Gambling is rife in prisons, it's higher than outside. That doesn't mean, as Gracia said, that people stop when they come out. In fact, probably they will spin out of control in terms of their gambling and they will use other ways of doing it. And that could be um, mixed with domestic abuse and violence because that could actually be coercing someone into taking out a loan. It could be um, asking someone to, to be involved in crime with them in order to uh, serve their addiction. So, uh, that, as we said, there's a criminal justice system, a team that that, that work um, with with those people. And the third one I'll mention is social isolation. So, as you can imagine, uh, the prospect of downloading an app and having a casino in your lounge whenever you need it, and the fun that that might bring, um, has been crucial actually, and um, a key in terms of COVID. You know, people have have started gambling where perhaps they wouldn't have before. We've been limited in the amount of excitement that we can get and the people that perhaps we've been able to interact with. So um, gambling has provided a social platform for people because often these apps will also provide chat rooms. Um, so people can actually meet friends online, maybe even date online, you know, through a boxy bingo site, for example. Um, and so social isolation means that people will go to to lengths perhaps if they aren't able to go outside to use their you know that their platforms more like their mobiles or their laptops and um, they'll look out things for fun and often those things that they look out for for fun will be uh, gambling apps and, and then often the harm can start over to you Gracia. Thanks, Claire. Um, one of the ones I wanted to touch on was that trauma, abuse and neglect. And that's a big one, especially for women specifically, um, using gambling as a coping mechanism to kind of form of escapism to deal with the trauma that they've experienced. And it can also be a big barrier for women as well, accessing support and services for their gambling addiction, because they are really scared that they're now going to have to relive that trauma or deal with the trauma. And they're not ready for that yet. So it is really about being sensitive as well as to people, why people do take part in gambling and do unfortunately become addicted to it. That conversation has to have, um, has to be had with a lot of care and a lot of sensitivity because you don't know what the underlying issues are and um, you also have there as well um using drugs and alcohol and that comorbidity between um 
um, alcohol and gambling and also drugs and gambling. Specifically, we see cocaine, which is a big one when it comes to gambling. Loads of our, um, people that li do lived experience with us talk about using cocaine to keep them up for longer so they can gamble for longer hours or using alcohol to console themselves after they've lost copious amounts of money. Um, and you also see that high and parental, high, low and high parental supervision, which I'm sure Lindsay will touch on as well when she talks about the young people. But my parents hate that one. Every time they see that on screen, they're like, we can never win as parents we're too strict you become gambling addicts we're not strict enough you become gambling addicts but it is really important that we are taking into consideration the high amount of numbers of young people not engaging in gambling and unfortunately becoming addicted to gambling and knowing how we can kind of address that safely as well thank you Lindsay So what does women's gambling look like? Um, and we can see just a few things that are specific to women when it comes to gambling. And I touched on a lot of them already earlier, but that to escape, distract or forget. So like I said, using it as a coping mechanism to deal with the stresses of life or either with trauma. We also see with women, women start to gamble later in life than, um, than men, uh, which is something that's really interesting. And one of the things I can say about gambling um, in terms of research and data is that we are far behind, severely far behind other the substances like um, substance misuse and, and alcohol addiction but some of the evidence that we have started to gather is kind of trying to paint a picture around what gambling does look like for the different genders for younger people and um, what it looks like in certain communities and really trying to adjust our services so that we can we can make sure that we're providing the best treatment support available and um, we see a lot of um, women take place at place and um, take part in chance-based games and um, Claire touched on that before you we would rarely see women going into betting shops they're more likely to take part on online games online reels as well something that we see and um, also we see um, with in terms in terms of men and women, we see um, women become um, addicted to, to gambling faster than their male counterparts. So some of the research that has been coming across that we've been seeing as well, which is something that um, is very interesting to us. Um, and we think some of the reasons for that is because women take part in gambling on their own. So as Claire touched on before, it is very much social isolation that drives them into gambling. Um, whereas a lot of times we see men take part in gambling with friends, football betting, going into bookies and doing it as a social activity. And then we also find it that women find it harder to speak to, um, to, speak to services. Um, and we find it and harder to find services that speak to women's experiences specifically as well. And that was one of the reasons why the women's program was kind of funded in GAMCare initially, because we saw that there was a massive gap in terms of um, services that looked specifically at the way women participate in certain activities and how they deal with certain addictions. So those are the things that we've seen in terms of gambling for women. So for young people, um, the ladies have touched on most of these, but I just want to mention males. So I know most of the people you work with are 18 and over. Um, so men between the ages of 24 and 35 are most, most at risk of becoming problem gamblers. Um, and that's why a lot of females are affected others. Um, an early exposure, really important one for younger people. So through our young person survey, gambling commission survey, and from just experience from clients coming through our service, early exposure does put younger people at risk of gambling when they are younger and then into their 20s and then potentially having a problem or addiction to gambling. So for example, watching parents gambling, um, parents allowing children to scratch off scratch cards, which I know so many people don't do, don't really think about it. Um, you know, in shops, if a shopkeeper sees that, they can refuse to actually serve um, the parent. Uh, watching dad place bets, you know, these days, especially in sort of the five, past five years because smartphones, watching mum, you know, on a phone all the time, Foxy Bingo, Gala Bingo, things like that. Um, so that is a big one to remember, really. Early exposure, um, and more likely to uh, try gambling, basically. And as Gracie mentioned, it's, you know, it's so accepted it's so normalized in our society it's legal in lots of countries and religions it's not but uh, lots of people do gamble in the UK um, ethnicity so a couple of reports some research has shown that non-white ethnicities are more at risk of gambling harm in younger people there's some more research needed on that um, and risk takers so 
young people when their brain is changing, um, chemicals are changing in their brains, they're more at, at, actually at risk to become addicted to something, to push the boundaries, to get that thrill, that excitement, and they just don't really understand what chance is. So when I go into schools, um, I say some, you know, the one thing I want you all to remember is chance. We talk a lot about what it is. A lot of them don't know what it is. They don't know what risk is. Um, and that's a part of, you know, part of growing up and knowing what's safe and what's not. And unfortunately, we're talking a lot um, in our young people's presentations about the dangers of online products, whether it's gambling, whether it's just in-game purchases, um, because a lot of it is set up to be addictive to young people. Um, and mental health issues, so escapism really, young people, you know, wanting to escape negative elements of life, maybe poor coping styles because they've been through some trauma. Um, so a few things really to look out for if you've got clients who are younger or clients in the, you know, their 20s, but they do have issues with gambling. It gives you a bit, bit of perspective really on, on uh, the risks uh, for them. I just want to tell you a bit about actually what happens when we gamble. So a lot of research into this at the moment. We still don't know so much about what happens in the brain, but what we do know is dopamine is involved um, and a lot of young people actually know this word I don't think I did when I was 14 15 but because of so many uh, social media products online products because they involve dopamine I think basically they just know a bit more about it um, so the brain releases dopamine um, when it anticipates that we're going to feel something good or something good's going to happen for us it motivates us to participate in the activity again so particularly, you know, social media, getting likes, people watching your story, um, getting WhatsApp notifications um, and, and, you know, gambling online. Um, will you win? Won't you win? The more time this pathway is used, the more automatic the reaction becomes. Uh, risk taking also activates the brain's reward system. So um, a lot of these products um, use this reward system. It's very accessible. You know, it's, it's easy to use. Um, it's quick. Um, so it's all about that spike in dopamine. Um, when those receptors become a bit blunted, when you do it for a long time, um, your brain just needs more, really, it needs more dopamine. So you, therefore, you carry on doing that activity a bit more. Um, so I, what I'll do is I won't, I, I don't think we've got time to have a chat about this, but um, just think to yourselves, um, if you know what this is, 99% of adults, professionals I speak to, you don't know what it is. Um, it's not a car battery, it's called a loot box or a loot crate or a FIFA pack. So around half of all uh, 11 to 16 year olds have heard of in-game items and have just under half have paid money, money for these items in the game that they were playing. 6% have done something called skins betting. So you open your loot box, it's in a, a game online, under 18 games, over 18 games, um, but you don't know what's in it. However, at the moment, it's not regulated as gambling. Skins betting, a um, bit more of a complicated process, but a few games online at the moment allow you to take that um, item that you've won from your loot box and basically gamble it um, online on other websites. A lot of these websites aren't based in the UK. Um, it's a bit of an ecosystem. Um, it's basically um, available because Steam are a regulated um, site, a gaming site. Um, through Steam, you can basically sort of trade your item, basically. And if you want to gamble on over 18 casino websites, then it's pretty easy to do so if you know how. Um, so this is why we're talking to adults and parents and professionals at the moment, because most people don't know what is available to young people, because it's not regulated as gambling, because there's no safeguarding in place on the Internet for these kind of things at the moment. Um, there's no warning system for parents or caregivers, really. So it's just around sort of creating awareness of what's available. I want to mention esports as well. So all of the major betting companies. So you've got the usual ones, Bet365, William Hill, Ladbrokes, um, all of those which are now online, also provide odds for esports. So um, gaming now has turned into a massive activity for young people to actually watch other people gaming. So when I was gaming when I was younger, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't watch other people, I just played the game. Um, but now through YouTube, Twitch, other platforms, um, young people watch other people playing games online and this is called esports. Um, a lot of advertising on this on social media so just be aware of, um, of, of this really that it's available that it's marketed towards younger people. And now I want hey guys. to oh, hey, Gary, can can I play to, uh, to quick one. So because the people that you work with are older I want to mention a bit about trading. So at the moment trading isn't really 
connected with gambling support. It's regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, not by the Gambling Commission. Um, but we are starting to talk about it because it's such a big option now for, I would say, people 16, 17, 18 into their 20s. Lots of adverts on social media, lots of Instagrammers, sort of what we call um, uh, social media gurus, sort of selling a dream, selling a lifestyle. But a lot of people don't agree it's gambling. So, um, you know, we, have, we talk about this in schools and we say, even if there's a small chance, you know, you don't know what the market's going to do. It is gambling, this video. Um, does explain it quite well. If you can't watch this for any reason, I'll just send around afterwards. Good morning. Uh, yeah, sure. How much do you need? Oh, just a tenner. I paid three grand. What? I, I have, have a hot, hot tip. tip. Oh, no, I don't like gambling with money. Oh, no, this isn't gambling. <laughs> I'm investing in shares. Oh, I'm gambling on horses. Uh, kind of sounds like the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. No, it's thing. totally different. I'm investing in a company's growth. But I'm investing in Peddler's Dream in the three o'clock at Fairy House. But you can still both lose, right? Well, yeah. I've been studying the markets. Yeah, I've been studying the forms. so. This thread on Reddit was Yeah, saying. the guys in the pub were That's saying practically it's a sure thing. thing. But there's still risk, though. Well, the advantages of stocks is that you can diversify your portfolio to mitigate that risk. Yeah, I put a tenner on each way. I've got holdings across all different sectors. Oh, Utilities, yeah, yeah. Horses, real estate, football, tech, lacrosse, energy. gymnastics. Yeah, I'm relying on good information. Oh, yeah, i got sources. Quintech are getting in a new CEO. Sunderland are bringing in Jose Mourinho. We're not the same. We're exactly the same. Why do you want my money? What happened to yours? Well, unfortunately, I didn't get an initial return on my investments. I lost my bollocks last week. Then why would I give you my money? Well, the market was so volatile It was meant to be a fall. sure thing. No one could have predicted League that. League 1 opposition? But it's going to bounce back. They're not going to lose two on the trust. Just need a little injection of capital. Just a few quid. Gary. Come on, Gary. Um, I, I'm going to have to think about well, it. the market's about the to close. The about to start. You don't even need a broker. Need a you can just, you can just do, do it all on my phone. phone. No, okay? I'm not gambling my money away. It's irresponsible and it's dangerous. Oh, is that the news? Oh, turn it up there. I want to get the lotto numbers. What? Okay, so it just gets you thinking about gambling, trading. Um, if you are working with a younger person who is trading, they mention stocks and shares, Forex trading, um, which is gambling on the foreign exchange, trading with cryptocurrency as well. We're starting to talk a lot about cryptocurrency. Just maybe have that conversation with them. You know, there is chance involved. It is still a form of gambling. Okay, so impacts of problematic gambling on the gambler and any affected others. So impacts on young people, um, disruption of peer and family relationships, so mum and dad arguing, um, personality changes maybe with their, with their parents, affecting the young pe person, not going to school, not going to college, um, not turning up for work, comorbidity, so this is um, drinking or taking drugs, then gambling, then taking more drugs and carrying on that cycle really, um, truancy or not going to university, not going to college, pulling away from friendship groups, becoming very isolated, which is a real risk now because of the past couple of years, but spending basically all of their life online. And mental health, so around half of all problem gamblers are struggling with mental health as well. Um, it's a risk, it's also an impact. And for younger people, antisocial behaviour and crime. So, you know, trying to get their hands on more money so they can carry on that cycle of gambling. Over to you, Claire. Sorry, I'm just about to cough, sorry. Um, yeah, this is um, this is an advert that's gone out recently when we think about affected others. Um, because often, you know, the adverts that maybe we see on the television are quite glossy and they're quite glamorous. So often it's women that are dressed up and it's party time and they're, you know, they're, they're finery, they look great, they're happy. Arms are in the air celebrating and everything's really gleeful. Um, they're a community, you know, they're having fun. Um, the reality that uh, certainly Grace Yell and I see on the women's programme is not that. Um, it's more of someone who is isolated and is living in her own head, is um, separating herself from her family. As you can see, it's not by accident that the, the bed is elongated there. Someone who is, um, if worried, is nervous and scared. Um, and often with someone in the background there, a carer or a partner or a friend, whoever it might be there at the end of the bed, who's working like mad to keep it all together, to, to, to distract that child, to make sure that, uh, that the bills are still paid, to make sure that uh, life is continuing as normally as possible, despite the fact that everyone else is getting really affected by it. Uh, so the uh, strap line there, as you can see when you're there, 
but not there. Um, and this was an advert from the National Gambling Treatment Service. So a few things here. Um, if I tackle resources, Bryce, yeah, and you tackle the other two, that would be okay. Um, so as we've talked about with, with women, um, and it can be with adults generally, this is a silent addiction. And it sounds such an obvious thing to say in terms of addiction, but the obvious thing that makes it different from every other addiction pretty much is that you can't see it and you can't smell it. And if that is the case, it means that people can do an awful lot of damage before anyone else in the family notices it. Um, and there are some really bad effects of problematic gambling that doesn't just affect the gambler, but does affect many other people as well. Probably about eight to 10 people, we think, per problematic gambler. Like incidentally, in the Southwest, the average problematic gambler's debt is about 77,000 um, pounds. And, uh, and certainly, uh, till a couple of Aprils ago, you could gamble on a credit card. People sort of reported really that it was just a series of numbers. They didn't even see it as many. So resources is a big one. Um, so in your professional capacity, if people aren't going to open up about gambling, one of the first things I think that would be apparent is debt. Debt, I would say, is pretty much 99% of cases people present with debt. They're happier, in fact, to talk about debt, um, credit card debts or problems with paying bills than they would ever be about gambling addiction. Um, so in the resources section at the top there, we, we know of people who are taking out loans, um, remortgaging their homes, um, even things like becoming um, executors to wills and then spending people's money uh, through that, and people's inheritance through that, uh, people going to loan sharks out of sheer desperation, people becoming homeless because they just gamble everything till there's nothing left. And probably for this purpose uh, today is Stop Adult Abuse Week about coerced debt. So people who are actually are being forced into taking a debt for someone else, because maybe that someone else isn't credit worthy anymore, or maybe that someone else hasn't got any resources left to do it, and actually being forced and pushed into doing it. Um, bills being unpaid, and as we said there, you know, debt is very prevalent among problematic gamblers. Um, also, we've got um, repossessions happening, um, evictions, lost savings, you know, and often children's savings, you know, people being um, the owners, if you like, or carers of people of children's savings, and then children getting to an age and they realise that all those savings have gone, perhaps those university savings we hear about sometimes. Gambling on credit, um, as we said, credit cards until fairly recently, payday loans, um, people who become unemployed because of the fact that they're gambling at work or they're gambling all through the night and they haven't got the energy for work at the end of it, their fraud um, and economic abuse. So um, when you are thinking about this conversation with people, just as a jigsaw really, I always think of this slide, think of the fact that if, if any of these picking up, there could actually be a connection. You know, if there is poor performance or there is eviction or there is mental health issues, is actually there's something going on underneath it that could be, that could well be gambling and could be problematic gambling. So uh, just over to Grace here for relationships and health. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I absolutely right. I think with gambling, it's really hard. It's, it is really hidden, like Claire mentioned, and it is really about piecing together that puzzle, trying to get that full picture. And you will never know unless you ask um, and just asking in the most sensitive way possible because of all these gambling related harms um, that we've kind of touched on. So you do see that poor performance at work, people being preoccupied by their gambling and that parent to child violence as well, something that we've seen quite often. Um, I did some work with some social workers in London recently and one of them disclosed that oh, there's twins that she was working with and they had said, we know when daddy loses with the gambling because he comes home and he hits us. Um, and that's something that she was, she was really alarmed to hear, but she didn't know what to do next in terms of addressing the gambling side she was like I had no clue where to go and so that training was really beneficial for her you also see family breakdown and um, domestic abuse like I touched on as well as a big thing and it's a more prevalent thing we've been seeing with our calls to our helpline that there's been an increasing number of people flag flagging up domestic abuse as well in terms of safeguarding and that's something we're working really hard to, do, to address um, that violence and, and anger as well in terms of the lack of tolerance people have when it comes to their withdrawal from gambling 
struggling is, plays a big part with their mood and the way they react as well to certain situations. And physical and emotional neglect as well is something that we've seen quite often. And when I was doing lived experience, someone shared their experience about her husband was a problematic gambler. And she said it's only after she found out about the gambling that she started to realize that he'd really started re neglecting himself. He stopped shaving, just little things that he'd do before he stopped doing. And she never noticed it until she found out about the gambling. So it really is about paying attention to all these little things and trying to piece together that picture. Um, like Claire mentioned before. And then the other side that we can see health. So suicidal thoughts, like I mentioned before, people contemplating suicide or completing suicide, very, very um, um, unfortunate, but with gambling, we see so often drug and alcohol use, like I touched on earlier as well. Um, and also uh, things like anxiety and depression, even going to GPs and disclosing that people have depression and um, not even being comfortable to disclose that it's because of their gambling addiction. And uh, Claire does amazing work as well with GPs in her area around trying to make sure that that question is being asked. It's not about, like she said, it's not about making everybody gambling experts, but it's about making sure we are identifying so we can can signpost to the correct um, treatment places, to the correct support, so people can get help for that. Um, because people do, it does result in people self-harming, in people getting a lot of more physical health problems because of their gambling. And if that gambling is not identified, then it's hard to really understand what the underlying issue is. You just see the kind of the top, the top of it. So the depression, the anxiety, but you're not really understanding what is what is driving that. So it is really about asking that question. And we will talk about that starter question a little bit later on. But I think that's one of the things we're really driving for is really asking that question and creating that environment so someone can disclose that. Thanks, Lindsay. So like Claire mentioned before, there's about six to 15 affected others per problematic gambler. Um, and that's a massive number. That's a bigger number than they actually are problematic gamblers. And at GamCare, one of the things we're very passionate about is providing support for people who are affected by somebody else's gambling. So not just the problem gambler, but anybody else who's affected by their gambling as well. And we work really hard at creating a safe space for them because one of the things we'll see when we look at impacts is how the impacts that impact the problematic gambler also impact the affected other and they're not the ones who are partaking in gambling so it is a really difficult place for them to sit in in terms of um, I'm, I'm getting all these impacts for something that I haven't I haven't participated in and knowing how what to do what to, what steps to take forward as well in terms of especially in the situation where the problematic gambler is not ready to get support and treatment it is important that and as, as an affected other you can access support and treatment in your own right. Thanks, Lindsay. So nine out of 10 affected others experience emotional distress and over half of affected others experience mental ill health. And then 69% of affected others covered the gambler's losses. And that's something I actually heard um, in some lived experience work that we um, that I did with a lady who had covered 15,000 pounds worth of debt, her son's debt actually, that she had covered. Um, and that was over a period of three years. So you can imagine what that financial toll took on her. Um, and she was, I mean, she said, you know, my retirement fund is basically depleted at this point. There's, it's just so much stress and anxiety for her. And she was actually being medicated because of that situation. But really her having a place to come and talk to someone about what she could do next and have her own space to discuss what was going on in her life was really beneficial for her. Mm -hmm. So one in three families with children experience family breakdown, and you can understand why. And one in three families struggle to afford essentials such as food and rent as well. So that impact on young people is something that we see quite often. And um, like Lindsay said, it really is about educating young people as well about gambling and not having a skewed version of seeing, or just seeing one side of it, but really understanding as a whole. So that education is really important. Thanks, Gracia. So what can you do to support people affected by gambling related harm? All of our support services and counselling services are free. All of our education and awareness sessions are free. So we just want you to basically incorporate this into your practice. If people know a bit more about gambling, they understand it. Um, they're not afraid to approach it with someone, to approach a subject with someone. It's easier to incorporate it. So add to your referral form, to your assessment form. 
um, and, and in your personal life as well. Don't be afraid to um, approach a subject with something, has with someone, has your gambling or the gambling of someone close to you had a ne negative effect on your life? Um, what we find is it's such a secret addiction, it's so hidden with drugs and alcohol, a lot of the time there are physical signs. They can be with gambling, um, but they're more subtle. It's not as obvious. People can gamble for years and years, and they do without anyone knowing until they reach what we call crisis point, whether you know debt gets too much um, or they unfortunately try to harm themselves. So your options are, first of all, offer brief advice. So a quick talk with the person, pass on support. We've got lots of resources on our website, gamcare.org.uk leaflets that you can print out, put up in your practice. The National Gambling Helpline is the main helpline in the UK to call to access free support and advice. It's 24 seven um, and uh, it's confidential. Um, to access local support services, you can, you can do that through the National Gambling Helpline or you can call them um, straight. Um, and we're always here to ask, you know, if you need advice about, um, you know, some, your situation or, or someone at work, do you just give us a call? If you want to become to our free 90 minute training with the CPD accredited, you get a CPD certificate and we go into a bit more de detail really about how to carry out a brief intervention. So this is a proper conversation with someone um, using the frames technique. So um, feeding back on what they're talking about, they have to take responsibility for what's happening, giving them advice and many of options, making sure you're empathetic and encouraging self-efficacy. So encouraging those positive behaviors for example, I'm going to set a spending limit. I'm going to only gamble with other people. I'm not going to chase my losses. Uh, and GAMCARE support services, so lots available through GAMCARE. It's all free. Adult local treatment services. I'll give you the one for the Southwest in a moment. National Gambling Helpline, web chat. A lot of young people come through the Big Deal website web chat. So specific website is uh, bigdeal.org.uk um, and they, they don't want to talk. Um, so there are options to chat to a practitioner or to fill out a test uh, online. Um, chat rooms, lots of people with lived experience, you know, talking about their experiences, sharing their experiences, um, lots of free resources and leaflets. The Young People Support Service, this was set up last year. It's for um, young people 11 to 18 years old, and I'll give you the details in a moment. Um, Game Change is CBT online through, through GAMCARE, through the, the GAMCARE website. Something that's a really good option is um, GAMBAN. So um, if you, you're talking to someone, they want to just cut anything to do with gambling on any of their devices. This is now free through um, the National Gambling Helpline. So basically for any UK regulated site, um, your device will stop you seeing um, you know, websites and apps um, and something called GamStop. So that's when you can basically prevent yourself from going into Betfred, you know, William Hill, um, places like that on the high street and casinos. Um, as I said, the Young Person Support Service. So um, you can basically email, phone, chat, um, refer that young person, that young person's contacted within 24 hours, uh, the practitioner works through a support plan with them and family and carers can be involved with their permission and there's always uh, an aftercare plan put in place. So um, for you in the southwest, your local free support is through ARA, so ARA are a partner of GAMCARE and they provide all of the free counselling and support in the southwest. So you can get to ARA through the National Gambling Helpline or um, you can just call them straight and we'll send details to you by email. Um, and finally, what else do we provide? So as I mentioned before, free training, um, let me know, let us know if you want to book onto one of our free CPD workshops. Um, we do short presentations, so we go into people's meetings online, you know, it can be anything from five minutes to sort of an hour, um, trustee meetings, you know, team meetings, things like that. Um, and myself and Claire in the Southwest and Grace here in London, ongoing contact for you basically. So if you're yeah, just not sure about where someone sits on sort of the support plan, the support map, give us a call. Um, any question at all, just you know, send us an email or give us a call. So uh, just to leave you with a thought really, just start the conversation. So if you can just put that starter question into your practice, um, then we can start raising more awareness around this. So thank you so much for your time. Um, are there any questions for any of us? Feel free to unmute or or use the chat. Emily, if you can.